let us continue with the previous case discussion and uh, patient had uh, oxybutynin in prescribed not very effective coming after three months and then changed to solifenacin developed significant dry mouth and then uh, the combination was also tried but not much progression with that so what is your next step a patient failed with solifenazine, mirapegron and oxybutynin. So I will counsel this patient regarding starting this patient on uh, Betmega, uh, which is mirapegron, uh, which is a beta-3 agonist. Um, um, and I will also give this option of ha uh, having this uh, along with uh, an anticholinergic, as evident in the Synergy study that shows better outcomes of combination therapy rather than monotherapy of either of these medications. I would want to rule out any uh, uh, contraindication for this medication, for example, uncontrolled hypertension, uh, and will also warn the patient about um, the side effects, including nasal uh, congestion, high blood pressure. Okay, so you are reviewing this patient in three months' time. The patient is not happy with the medicines. What is your next step? So next step, um, if um, this patient on examination had any uh, signs of... Uh, um, uh, de estrogenization uh, that I would I will also prescribe him uh, some estrogen pessaries. Uh, if this patient isn't still not uh, getting better with her symptoms, then I will arrange this patient to have urodynamic studies. Okay, so what is the purpose of urodynamic study? What are you going to look for? Um, so I'm going to look for uh, the compliance uh, of uh, urodynamic studies, um, com uh, contraction. Uh, capacity and continence. Okay, so what do you what are you expecting to see? This patient is undergoing urodynamic study. What do you think you may I, come across? With the symptoms of this patient, I suspect that this patient will have detrusor over, over activity or might have detrusor over activity. Also, this will give me a good idea about the capacity of the patient's bladder. Also, I would want to rule out any incontinence as well. Okay, if there is no detrusor over activity, what is your next step? Um, um, I'm sorry, I should also mention regarding compliance of the bladder. I want to make sure the bladder, bladder is compliant. If there is no detrusor, uh, detrusor over activity um, and the patient um, uh, is still having symptoms of um, overactive bladder. Um, sorry, Mr. Darsha, can I just ask, what symptoms did this patient have? No, the patient present with frequency both day and night and urgency. Uh, okay, urgency and frequency. Okay. I mean, so, I, Ali, what I, what I want you to bring in is uh, MDT. Okay, that's the main thing. So, oh, okay. yeah, before any surgical options or if the urodynamics is not showing detrusor over activity, bring in MDT. That's what I, I was expecting. Okay. Okay, so you need to discuss the patient in MDT before any invasive treatment. Yes, there is a mixed view about uh, botulinum toxin A where some institutes, they will say there is no point in discussing uh, MDT for patients who are undergoing botulinum toxin because in some tertiary centers, there may be hundreds of patients having Botox again and again. But uh, this is the general advice. But if, if a place is nicely a center of excellence, there is nothing wrong in going ahead with Botox before MDT also. But once the Botox fails, patient should be discussed in MDT. Okay. okay. So you said next stop is uh, botulinum toxin. Explain botulinum toxin. Uh, so botulinum toxin works by stopping the exocytosis of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular ju junction. Um, um, in a, a non-neuropath, uh, the adequate dose is 100 international units in a neuropathic patient. The adequate dose uh, or the initial dose is 200 international unit as evident by the Embark and Dignity study respectively. Uh, the patient needs to be, uh, there are some prerequisites for this and one of the requisites is the patient should be able to do self-intermittent catheterization in case the patient goes into urinary retention, which I will counsel this patient about. Um, other side effects of, of these include um, uh, retention of urine and infections. Okay. Uh, how will you perform the procedure? So this procedure is performed under general anesthesia. After adequate uh, WHO checklist, um, I will put the patient in a lithotomy position. When the patient is wrapped and draped, I'll do a rigid cystoscopy and uh, instill um, uh, 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 Botox um, uh, uh, 
in all, in all the four quadrants of the bladder, uh, giving 0.5 mils. The Botox is 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 um, is made uh, by uh, dissolving it in uh, 10 mils of, of uh, saline and uh, 0.5 uh, uh, mils of uh, aliquots are given in uh, various quarters, uh, various uh, uh, quadrants of the bladder, making sure that we spare the uh, bladder neck. You mentioned about Embark study, what it says? Um, so the Embark study um, uh, says that uh, the patients uh, who were given 100 international units, non neuropathic patients with uh, overactive bladder given 100 international units, had significant improvement in their symptoms uh, with at least uh, a side effect profile. Okay, so this patient you are, when are you going to review what further things you will explain to the patient before she leaves? Um, so uh, once um, I have given this patient uh, the intravasal Botox, I will explain that if she goes into urinary retention, she should use the uh, self catheter uh, um, and uh, present herself to or get in touch with the neurology department where we can see her a bit sooner. I will also explain that this is a temporary measure and in some people uh, these effects can last anywhere from uh, uh, three to six months uh, or even a bit longer to up to nine months. And once her symptoms starts getting worse, she needs to get in touch with ourselves so we can arrange another intravasal Botox injection. I would still like to see her again in my clinic uh, in about uh, four to six months time. Okay, she comes with inadequate symptom relief. Her daytime frequency reduced from 8 to say 6 and nighttime frequency reduced from 4 to 2. She still struggles a bit. So what will you do? Um, if she's still struggling with this, um, I'll discuss the options of uh, uh, increasing uh, the Botox injection uh, for her um, to, to see if this patient uh, would want to go ahead with this. Okay. Any other thing you can increase the dose? Uh, yes, increase the dose. Okay. Uh, so if Botox fails completely, then I need to. I will discuss the options of uh, sacral nerve uh, modulation with this patient. Uh, the other option is going to be uh, posterior tibial nerve stimulation, as per the Bowers information leaflet. Okay, so you are increasing the dose from 100 to 200. She's not responding well. She also developed one episode of retention. She is aware of intermittent catheterization, so she was able to empty herself, but uh, she wants to go for other options. So explain the sacral neural modulation. So sacral nerve modulation works. Um, uh, there's two, it's a two-stage pr procedure. It works by uh, uh, stimulating the sacral nerve, uh, thus by inhibiting uh, the blood uh, over overactivity. The initial phase is where, is where they insert uh, tine leads into uh, the S3 foramen under uh, under um, um, under general anesthesia. Um, and uh, a temporary uh, um, uh, a temporary battery is attached. Uh, the patient is uh, um, uh, the discharge of the battery can be uh, uh, tailored according to patient uh, comfort. Uh, the patient is reassessed uh, later, and if there is at least thirty percent improvement in patient symptoms, then this can be converted into a permanent uh, a battery. Uh, which um, can last uh, uh, for about 10 years or more. Uh, the newer uh, secular modulators are uh, uh, MRI compatible as well. Any studies you have are aware of supporting secondary modulation? Um, so there is a Rosetta 1 and Rosetta 2 trial that compares Botox versus uh, cyclonerve nerve stimulation. Uh, uh, and it shows that uh, they are uh, have equal efficacy. However, secular modulation uh, did require revision uh, and Botox was more associated with uh, uh, urinary retention and UTIs. Okay. So after understanding the pros and cons, patient is not very happy with second neural modulation. She is a bit uh, hesitant to have the manipulation of the nerves, etc. When you explain the S3 level, etc. What other options she has? other options she has is clamp augmentation schistoplasty uh, and the last option is going to be a urinary diversion in clamp um, augmentation schistoplasty uh, i'll explain that this is uh, uh, done by taking 25 centimeters of distal uh, ilium um, and detubularizing the, uh, the the ilium 
and uh, 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 stitching it to the anterior aspect of the bladder, uh, thus by increasing the bladder capacity and reducing the due to the contraction as well. Okay. What, are, if, what are the surgical methods you said? Uh, the other option is going to be a urinary diversion by, uh, uh, for example, uh, ileal conduit. Okay. It's time now, Ali. So we'll stop here. How do you think you did? Um, I think I, I, I should have mentioned uh, MDT. That was a very important thing. Um, but I thought that I would have mentioned MDT uh, before offering um, uh, you know, treatment, uh, invasive treatment for this patient. Um, other than that, I'm, I'm not really sure um, as to, obviously I don't remember the exact details of all the studies in, in urology, um, but I do know briefly what the study meant. I'm not sure, do we need to know exactly about how much each study, you know, what the patient numbers were, what exact uh, results were of all these um, these studies. And secondly, with clampsostoplasty and uh, urinary diversion, the last measures for these uh, issues, um, I'm not aware of any studies. I'm not aware of, you know, the exact complications or how you do these uh, procedures in detail. Yeah, I hope that's okay for the purpose of this. Yeah, exam. I think you are in a in a very good state. That is, uh, your presentation is quite good. Uh, I mean, regarding the studies, see, people have passed hundreds and hundreds of people have passed without bringing Synergy study or Rosetta study, etc. The thing is, two things. If you are doing well, if you bring that single word of Synergy 1, Synergy 2 study, which compares Solifinacin, Mirabegron combination, that really boosts your mark. The, the examiner will be happy to give easy one mark for that single sentence of mentioning Synergy 1, Synergy 2 study. You can easily understand when hundreds and hundreds of candidates are getting 6, 6.5 continuously, suddenly making you 7 is a very big boost if you have a difficult table somewhere. That is one thing. And I, I don't bother much about the numbers and details because uh, as I usually say, except for BPH and prostate cancer, don't worry much about the studies. A lot of times I've come across students who are good in studies, but on the day of the exam, they won't present the studies. They will just go with the normal management. Of course, they are passing out comfortably. End of the day, that's our main uh, aim. But I think my aim is to make your presentations a touch better than what you may be doing on your own so that's why it's my duty to increase your quality of presentations a little bit as i said in the youtube in the background you can see what is synergy one what is synergy two and some numbers here and there don't worry much about the numbers but if you are confident if you are doing your own practice with your study buddies and if you have study mentioned synergy one and two two three times then why not make it a little bit better like uh, Synergy 2 is more for long-term safety and efficacy, while Synergy 1 is for short-term, and uh, Synergy 2 is a randomized multicenter trial, 1,700 patients. So you can increase the numbers here and there. You can bring in local MDT after urodynamics, especially if there is no detrus or overactivity, and as we discussed before, the surgical options, which you anyway are quite aware and you are about to bring them. and. Uh, when you bring study like embark study again the examiner may wish to test you that okay he's bringing is he really know about that study well or not so know a little bit few things a so double binary study placebo control randomized control study compare the evidence of botox and uh, say uh, sacral neuromodulation or what is the reduction of the urgency incontinence episodes and how long it works etc and um, so you know a little bit about the study so it's mainly on the evidence to support the botox oab and regarding okay. the botox function as such you mentioned heavy and light chain but you haven't got a very clear gist of it so botox how it works heavy and light chain heavy chain binds to presynaptic nerve ending so heavy chain function is only to bind the botox into the nerve ending it has no other function and then the toxin will be internalized by the receptor mediated endocytosis the light chain does the job of cleaving the snap 25 which blocks the exocytosis of acetylcholine since there are not much acetylcholine from presynaptic nerve ending there won't be much detrusor overactivity so if you understand it because every textbook has 
thousands of pictures nicely demonstrating this. So very simple, heavy and light chain. Heavy chain is purely for binding into presynaptic nerve ending, toxin getting internalized by receptor mediated endocytosis. The light chain will help in cleaving the SNAP25 and uh, it will also help in, by that it blocks the exocytosis of Western coli. So try to remember that because a lot of times we hear the question of how Botox works. Yep. Sacral neural modulation, your answers are quite good. You can quote EAU 2023. Rosetta trial is a, is a good one where it compared Botox and uh, sacral neural modulation. See, we always have a kind of an impression that if Botox fails, we can go for sacral neural modulation. But Rosetta trial clearly showed that both are almost same and uh, no big difference between in urge urinary incontinence episodes or in the cure. And in fact, Botox provide higher satisfaction and higher cure rate. And the only problem is intermittent self catheterization with many women are okay with that. While in secondary modulation, the chances of revision like 3%, removal of the implant 9%, that's quite cumbersome. And uh, regarding secondary modulation, you can bring in, it's not really completely MRI contraindicated. Nowadays, we are getting the newer generations of secondary modulation, which can be labeled as MRA conditional. So a patient can have up to 1.5 Tesla <coughs> abdomen or pelvis MRI and up to three Tesla of head MRI because head MRI is the one commonly used. Okay. The other thing is uh, <coughs> these kind of implants, we need to tell the patient about the airport security scanners. So they will be carrying a kind of a card to show that they have a medical device implanted. Okay. You completely missed P10 in between and went to surgery. I was really expecting you to bring few things on P10. So posterior nerve, tibial nerve stimulation. Uh, nowadays we are doing P10 even before sacral modulation. 30 minutes session weekly, maybe for six weeks. And once patient is comfortable, the maintenance is like every second week or every fourth week. Patient can do herself or himself if it is a male patient in home itself. Nice guideline. <coughs> Sorry. Nice guideline says, don't offer uh, uh, Peton so widely. But the nice guideline is slightly outdated. So when you are saying Peton, just be careful with that. So regarding augmentation cytoplasty, you can divide the complications. Mr. Ganesh, can I just quickly ask, yeah. would you offer Peton before cycle nerve or cycle mm -hmm. nerve? and then offer P10. No, th that's what we do before. In SWBH, we started P10 service now. So we are offering uh, Botox and if Botox is not working, we are offering P10. But if you see, even though sacral modulation is a bit uh, complex, requiring like uh, image intensifier, CM guided placement, etc. The efficacy of Botox and sacral modulation is almost the same. So it's only the non-availability of the training and widespread presence makes sacral modulation looks a bit great or the next step. So similarly, p is much more simpler. So there's nothing wrong in offering p a step before sacral modulation because it's an outpatient setting, no need for anesthesia. Uh, as I said, uh, weekly sessions for six weeks for the first patient training and then patient can go for home every second week or every fourth week. And uh, I will say, Try Botox if Botox is not working. Try P10, which is less invasive compared to sacral modulation. But beware, nice guidelines are not over supportive of it. But I'm sure the revision of nice guidelines will definitely support P10. There are lots of lot of evidences to support that. Um, regarding the surgeries like augmentation cystoplasty, also known as clamp cystoplasty, uh, while ex explaining the complications, you can divide into short term and long term. Short term like bowel obstruction, infection, thromboembolism, bleeding, fistula, long term like urine UTI stones, change in bubble symptoms, sometimes even bladder perforation, renal dip dysfunction because the renal metabolites will be reabsorbed by the bowel segment. But you should also bring in detrus or myomectomy, even though it's not performed that frequently. You can say that it is just incising, the excising a portion of the detrusor muscle, but nowadays not widely practiced. Regarding the urinary diversion, there are multiple types. Again, ileal conduit, orthotopic neobladder, heterotopic neobladder with mitrophin of continent. So you should be able to offer multiple times rather than just ileal conduit because you just mentioned urinary diversion. You haven't gone to 
multiple options available in that. Uh, but again, I'm just taking you guys to the best possible answer. Once you hear from me and use the YouTube material for further revision, I'm very sure you can easily make it into the 10 minutes. Um, this, so this overactive bladder as such is like a two scenarios, evaluation and medical management. And um, sure. the second part is like failed medical management, surgical options of less invasive and big, bigger surgeries like invasive surgeries of clamp cystoplasty, diversion, etc. Any questions in these two scenarios before we go to the next one? Yes, Mr. Anand, um, uh, when you mentioned that, that the urodynamic study didn't show um, uh, the throes of overactivity. No, no, no. I, I asked uh, us, uh, Ali an option. If the urodynamics is not showing detrusor overactivity, what will you do? It's just, yeah, so, just only uh, one question. Honest, I, yeah, I was expecting that uh, you would like to bring the ambulatory uh, urodynamics. Yeah, so that takes into a different uh, setup. Again, you can't go for ambulatory before MDT. So once the urodynamics done, if there is no detrusor overactivity, then we need to know really what is happening, whether it uh, transcribed the exact patient's home environment, office environment. So what is the problem in the urodynamics, whether we need to just repeat the urodynamics again, or as you said, ambulatory urodynamics. Uh, and we need to discuss it in the local MDT. Our patient urodynamics showed detrusor overactivity. That's why we proceeded further. And regarding the ambulatory urodynamics, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question and good answer to bring in, but it's very cumbersome. Uh, you need, again, a tertiary center to have that facility available and uh, interpreting the days and hours of interpretation into a concise manner is slightly difficult. But it definitely has a role, not only at this stage, even in the later stages where Botox given, patient not performing well, a patient you're heading towards like open surgeries, refractory overactive bladder, but the uh, urodynamics is not showing any major detrus or overactivity. So we need to see whether the patient is trying to maybe gather some attractions, is the real clinical picture. So in medical legal aspects also, ambulatory urodynamics comes into play. Yeah, that's a correct place to bring in ambulatory urodynamics, but again, it's only for tertiary centers. It's definitely not for a district hospitals. Any other questions on these scenarios? A couple of scenarios? No, thank you. Okay.